Good evening. I'm Alabaster Cats, and it's time to tell another tale in the dark. Welcome to the show. A huntsman is defined as one who hunts, especially one who hunts foxes. What makes this interesting is that foxes are notoriously difficult to catch. They conceal themselves, travel great distances, and don't move in straight lines. And when they sense that they're being hunted, they backtrack, circle around, and disguise their scent. Ironically, to avoid being caught, foxes employ the same misdirection that the huntsman uses to catch them. And that brings us to tonight's story. To answer a simple question, how do you know if you are the fox or the huntsman? So join me as we traipse through the sad and the strange and follow a huntsman who helps two children that are being hunted by the very witches he hunts. Once again, it's time to grab a drink, dim the lights, and blend in with the shadows. The show's about to begin. Sisters Five. By Alabaster Cats. Stranger, come in, come in, have a seat. Here you go, a pint of this, and you'll be warmer than a witch on Sunday. <laughs> so, are you new to the mountain or just passing through? Oh, you're just in time. She's about to start. Sing a rhyme, raise your 
Eulogy of Snow. Never was there a more dark and beautiful song. There isn't a soul in the mountain that doesn't know it. Why, just the other day I... Uh, wait, don't tell me you've never heard of the Sisters Five. Well, it's not wise to speak of them loosely, but I can't in good conscience leave you without at least sharing the tale. It's not just a story, mind you. It's also a warning. Yes, see, a long time ago, there was a huntsman. Safe behind doors with fires aglow. These were the thoughts of the huntsman as he sat on his horse and gazed down the mountain at the village below. Wisps of smoke rose from chimneys like souls departing the dead. There were no merchants selling in the square, nor children playing in the streets. No farmers gathering wheat, nor skinners tanning fur. The storerooms were full, the woodpiles were stocked, and all who hoped to see next spring were locked away in the safety of their homes, all except the huntsman. For only he, a man paid in gold, would set out into the darkness to kill that which lives there. A cold wind blew from the east as the huntsman pulled his furs tighter around his shoulders. He checked his crossbow for frost and the potions on his belt for ice. Then with an eye to the dying sun, he tapped his heels and urged his horse into the forest. It had snowed the night before, covering the ground in a blanket of white. Any sign that something had passed was long buried beneath it. However, this was of little concern to the huntsman, for he knew that what he was tracking was not required to set foot on the ground. (laughs) Venturing deeper into the woods, he continued his search until only the moon was left to light his way. It was then that the huntsman dismounted to procure the flint and tinder for his torch, that he heard a rustling in the bushes. Whipping around, he raised his crossbow and called out to the knight. Show yourself! he demanded. A moment later, the bushes parted and out crept a little boy and a little girl. The huntsman looked them over with a keen eye and noticed that the boy's hair had been crudely cut and that his muddied clothes were a size too large. As for the girl, her hair was a tangled mass, and she was wrapped in the tattered remains of an old dress. Both were filthy and lacerated with scratches. It didn't take long for the huntsman to conclude that they were running from something. Step into the light, he pressed. The boy glanced at the huntsman's belt where a large knife glistened in the torchlight. Lowering his crossbow, The huntsman smiled. Be still, boy. You have nothing to fear from me. What's your name? Reynard, he answered. And this is my sister Lavinia. Well met, Reynard. My name is Devlin. Tell me, why are you alone in these woods? Reynard moved closer with his sister's hand in his. We're being chased, sir, by a witch. 
Devlin raised an eyebrow. A witch, you say? Yes, sir, will you help us? Just then, the shrill of a ghostly howl echoed in the distance. Mmm, I see, Devlin said gravely. You're fortunate to have found me, for that is no ordinary witch that hunts you. She is called the Wild, and she's the first of the Sisters Five. The Sisters Five? asked Reynard. Yes, separately they are named the Wild, the Fool, the Temptress, the Liar, and the Murderess. Five witches that form the most dangerous coven in the mountains. Reynard swallowed the lump in his throat. How do you know so much about the Sisters Five? Devlin shrugged. I'm a huntsman. I was hired by the villagers to rid them of this menace. However, given that I cannot hunt with you by my side, I must now choose whether to leave you here or escort you home. The siblings exchanged nervous glances and Devlin chuckled. (laughs) I choose the latter, of course. Then the children smiled. Now tell me, where is your home? At an inn deep in the woods. You mean the one-eyed rabbit? I know of it. It's... A tiny place, well known amongst huntsmen, although I've never been myself. It's true, Reynard added. We're often visited by huntsmen. They've taught me how to read the forest. Only, I seem to have lost my way. Devlin nodded. The wild uses her magic to move the trees, making it easier to disorient her prey. But fear not, for all magic has its tells. Just need to look closely to see them. Reaching into his pack, Devlin pulled out two cloaks and tossed them to the children. Here, put these on before you catch your death. We will go on foot from here. As the night drew on, Devlin led Reynard and Lavinia deeper into the shifting forest. The huntsmen moved through the woods with the ease of someone born to them. And although the children were young, they found themselves struggling to keep up. It was only after Devlin had stopped that Reynard realized something was wrong. What is it? Whispered Reynard. The wild, answered Devlin. She has found us. Quickly, we must hide. Suddenly, a shrieking howl erupted from the trees and Devlin rushed the children down a small ravine. Grabbing a leafy branch, he dragged it behind them to conceal their footprints. Then he unbridled his horse and removed his saddle. Reynard, quick, give me your cloak. Doing as he was told, Reynard handed Devlin his cloak, and the huntsman tied it around his horse's neck. Then with a slap to the hindquarters, the horse took off running. What are you doing? asked Reynard. Leaving a trail to follow. Now lie down and be still. The trio pressed their bodies against the snow, and within moments, another screeching howl pierced the air. Then slowly... The vision of a woman riding the frozen carcass of a bear sauntered into view. The wild looked more beast than human. Crouched on the bear's shoulders, she wore a wolf skull headdress, a black fur cloak, and a leather loincloth. She arched her back to sniff the air, and when she did, her corpse blue skin glowed under the moonlight revealing the many tattooed sigils covering her body. Commanding the bear forward, she slowly circled the clearing before stopping at the lip of the ravine. The forest fell deathly silent. Devlin's muscles tightened around his crossbow, and his hand drifted to his knife. He glanced at Reynard, who was shivering in the snow, but remained absolutely silent. He could feel the unnatural cold of the bear's paws rolling down his back like a thick fog. Then with a snap of her neck, the wild turned her attention to the horse's trail and grinned with a mouth full of pointed teeth. Clutching her bone staff, she held it overhead to part the trees and the bear lurched after the huntsman's horse. For several moments, neither Devlin nor the children moved. It was only after hearing the crows overhead that they emerged from the ravine. It's clear, said Devlin. You can come up. Helping the children to their feet, Devlin took off his cloak and wrapped it around a shivering Reynard. Well done, boy. Well done, 
Reynard's lips curled into a smile. Are we safe? He asked, chattering his teeth. For now, but we must keep moving, for not all witches require scent in order to hunt. Numb from both the snow and the encounter, the children simply nodded and followed the huntsman deeper into the forest. The winter nights can be long in the mountains, and while the wind and the cold may be dangerous, every huntsman knew that it was the snow that would prove your undoing. Whatever strength was gained from food or rest was always lost trudging through the snow. Devlin knew that Reynard and Lavinia were more tired than they cared to admit. By himself, he could have pressed on, but with two children, he decided it was best to set up camp for the night. Retrieving the axe from his pack, he began to chop down branches to build a shelter. Reynard, can you make a fire? Of course I can. Devlin smiled. Good lad. Smiling back, Reynard grabbed a rock and began stripping a twig to make kindling. Minutes later, the children were sitting under a lean-to, warming their hands by the fire, and watching Devlin draw symbols in the snow with a stick. What are you doing? asked Reynard. Creating a barrier. These are called apotropaic symbols. They repel witches so long as they remain undisturbed. Lavinia glanced into the darkness and clung to Reynard's arm. Devlin knelt beside her and smiled. Fear not, little one. Not everything that lives in the dark is bad. There are good witches, too. Do the symbols keep them out as well? No, but only because they require different symbols. Really? Which ones? Devlin paused before answering. Snow angels, he said, grinning. Lavinia giggled. (laughs) Now then. No more talk of witches. Let's get some rest. Smiling, Reynard and Lavinia climbed under their blankets and drifted off to sleep. In the quiet of midnight, Devlin awoke to the sound of jingling. Grabbing his crossbow, he quickly rose to his feet and saw Reynard standing at the edge of the barrier. Reynard, what are you doing? Come away from there! Reynard didn't respond. Reynard? Suddenly, a woman wearing a red and black harlequin's garb stepped out of the darkness. Her face was powder white with eyes as red as her ruby grin. She wore mismatched colored gloves with long black fingernails and slippers topped with tiny bells. And on her head, a matching cap with two points curled like a ram's horns. She slowly approached, pointing her toes with each step before stopping in front of Reynard. Then she raised a throwing knife into the air and lowered it to the ground in a deep theatrical bow. The fool! shouted Devlin. Reynard, move out of the way! But Reynard continued to watch in a dazed stupor. The fool frowned at Devlin and held a finger to her lips requesting silence. Then with a wave of her hand, the forest swelled with music and she began to dance. She swayed and twirled like a spinning top, dragging the knife along her arms while darting in and out of Devlin's crosshairs. Then slowly, Reynard began to mimic her movements, lazily lifting his limbs as if tied to strings. He hopped and spun in time with the fool, and as he did, he kicked away the symbols at his feet. Devlin rushed to Reynard's side and yanked him away from the barrier. He aimed his crossbow and fired, but the fool deftly tumbled backwards, avoiding the shot. Landing gracefully on her feet, she twirled the knife between her fingers and grinned. Then with a magician's flair, she waved her hand and procured four more knives. Collecting them in a fist, she tossed them overhead, juggling each one with ease as she continued to dance. A moment later, the music came to an abrupt stop and the knives froze, suspended in air. She flashed a look of feigned embarrassment as if her trick had been revealed, only for her grin to return behind the tips of her fingers. Without warning, the knives turned to face Lavinia and hurled themselves in her direction. Lavinia screamed and Devlin quickly grabbed his fur bedding and tossed it into the air. The knives sunk harmlessly into its folds and fell to the ground. Then he turned to face the fool, 
but only in time to see the glint of metal plunge into his shoulder. Growling in pain, Devlin dropped his crossbow and grabbed a potion from his belt. He hurled it at the fool and it exploded on the ground, kicking up a silver mist. However, when the mist settled, the fool was gone, leaving only the fading sound of jingling in her wake. Worried for the children, Devlin raced to the lean-to to assess the damage. A reader of you hurt! Reynard sat up, dazed as if he'd been sleeping. What happened? The fool! She attacked us in our sleep! Devlin then looked at Lavinia, who was crouched under a tree with her eyes shut and ears covered. Will she be all right? She will, answered Reynard. Nodding, Devlin sat down and began to tend to his shoulder. Why does she not speak? Reynard sighed and got up to comfort his sister. When she was younger, she witnessed the death of our father at the hands of a witch. She's not spoken since. A swell of pity filled Devlin. I understand your pain, little one. I too have lost someone to the foulness of witches. Lavinia didn't respond. Did they die too? Asked Reynard. Having bandaged his wound, Devlin stood up and stared into the woods. In a way. But now is not the time to mourn. We must press on. The Sisters Five know we're here. Then with a grunt, the huntsman slung his crossbow over his good shoulder and began trudging through the snow. Hours after sunrise, Devlin and the children found themselves battling a raging storm. Cold winds ripped through their clothes as pebble-hard snow pelted their cheeks. Forced to seek shelter, Devlin led the children to a nearby cave. We'll wait here until the storm passes. Then we must move quickly, for it is likely the sisters five know where we are headed. Devlin took the flint from his pack and tossed it to Reynard, who began working on a fire. He then noticed a small spot of red on his tunic. Moving away from the children, he removed his bandage to inspect his wounds. The bandages, while soaked, did not reek of the putrescence that often foreshadowed infection. Satisfied, Devlin applied fresh wrappings and moved to rejoin the children. However, upon doing so, he caught the faint sound of a woman humming deep inside the cave. He turned to see if Reynard and Lavinia could hear it too, but they simply continued going about their business, completely unaware. Without a word of warning, he unslung his crossbow and stepped into the darkness of the cave. He followed the voice until he reached a large cavern where a woman was bathing alone in a hot spring. Trickles of water echoed off the walls as Devlin crept inside with his crossbow trained on her back. However, before he could get any closer, she stopped humming. Greetings, huntsman. I've been waiting for you. The woman's voice was smooth and smoldering as if her words flowed like molten silk. Rolling droplets glistened down her back, which was only covered by the drape of her long, dark hair. The curves of her hips, while tantalizing and delicate, were left to the imagination beneath ripples of water. Devlin's eyes traced the lines of her body, and although he knew she was a witch, he still felt the pool of her beauty. Keeping her back to him, The woman continued. Have you come to kill me? No, not yet. Then why have you come? The boy and the girl. I wish to see them home safely. Do not want you to interfere. Folding her arms to cover her chest, the temptress slowly turned around and Devlin's heart fluttered. It had been many years since he'd last seen the woman he loved. His eyes welled with tears, and he lowered his crossbow. The temptress frowned. It breaks my heart to see you this way, Devlin. No more than it breaks mine. The temptress glanced at Devlin's wound and took his hand. You are wounded, she said, concerned. It's just a scratch. I've survived worse. Releasing his hand, the temptress lowered her gaze. I did what I did, and I cannot undo it. Despite wishing otherwise. You gave yourself to witches! And for what? Eternal beauty? Power? Love, she replied. 
and as a result you were spared. I would rather have stayed with you. And have the curse take us both? Only the sisters had the power to save us. Yes, but at the price of each other. A price we both paid, it would seem. I chose so that you could live on, be happy and grow old in the arms of another. Not for you to consign yourself to the guilt that set you upon your path. And I will not stray from it. Not until you... Not until I kill the Sisters Five. Cupping a handful of water, the Temptress looked away and proceeded to bathe. I will not hinder you from your task, but nor will I help you. I am bound to the Sisters, as they are to me. I understand. Thank you. Tell me, of what importance to you are the children? Why risk your life for them? They are innocent, just as we were. I will not see harm come to them by the same evil. Abruptly dropping the water in her hand, the temptress looked at the huntsman, her face tight with worry. Devlin, you mustn't... But she looked away, as if unable to say more. Please, she whispered. Be careful. The lines on Devlin's face softened as he took her hand, and for a moment... They shared the memory of a spring meadow under a warm sun, and the scent of wild lavender in their clothes. Then the memory faded, and the huntsman was alone. The storm had passed by the time Devlin returned to the children, and despite their wondering faces, he gathered his pack and smothered the campfire without explanation. Time to go, he muttered. Doing as they were told, Reynard and Lavinia grabbed their cloaks and followed him into the cold. Hours later, the sun was warm, the winds were mild, and Reynard began to recognize his surroundings. Excited, he darted ahead of the huntsman. Devlin, I know these woods! I know where we are! Reynard, wait! But he didn't. He ran past the great tree where he and his sister would listen to crows past the hidden pond where they chased frogs, and through the bushes where they hunted mice. It was only when he saw the inn that he stopped. Mother! Mother! We're home! Seconds later, Devlin approached Reynard with Lavinia next to him. Hold, Reynard! We don't know if it's safe! Unslinging his bow, Devlin slowly opened the front door and entered the inn. The one-eyed rabbit was more of a cottage than anything else, furnished only with a single table, a kitchen, and a round window that served as its namesake. There was little else. Scanning the room, Devlin noticed that the fireplace had not been lit for at least a few days, and there were no fur cloaks hanging by the door. The inn was as cold and empty as the forest outside. A ball began to form in the pit of his stomach as the huntsman looked at the children, knowing that it was unlikely that their mother was still alive. Perhaps she's out looking for us, asserted Reynard. Perhaps. If that is the case, then you and Lavinia should wait here. I can stay with you if you wish. Reynard nodded in agreement, but as his eyes filled with tears, Devlin could see that the boy knew the truth as well. Food, said Devlin, changing the subject. You both must be hungry. Let's get you something to eat. Opening the cupboards, Devlin began gathering various herbs and vegetables for a stew. He filled the water jug and poured it into the cauldron hanging in the fireplace. Then, after dicing up the ingredients, he poured them into the pot and went to light the fire. Reynard, where'd you keep your firewood? Out back, he replied. Rising to his feet, Devlin moved to the back door to let himself out. Aside from a small space where the firewood was stacked, the back of the cottage opened into unchecked wilderness. Devlin tucked a log under his arm and turned to head inside when his eye caught something black lying in the snow. Moving closer to investigate, he saw that it was Reynard's cloak, the one he had tied to his horse, and next to it, a flower that didn't bloom in the winter, a small sprig of lavender. Devlin's muscles tensed as he dropped the log and raised his crossbow. 
Rushing back inside, he found Reynard sitting alone at the table. Reynard, where is your sister? She went outside, he replied startled. Why? Is something wrong? Panicked, Devlin moved to the front door but stopped when he noticed Lavinia's cloak on the back of her chair. Alarms rang in his mind and he could feel that something was wrong. He began to wonder how they eluded the wild when he forgot to remove Lavinia's cloak. He wondered how the fool's magic enthralled Reynard before the symbols were disturbed. Then he recalled Reynard's crudely cut hair and oversized clothes and concluded that it was the perfect disguise for a little girl who wanted to appear as a boy. Backing away from the table, Devlin aimed his crossbow at Reynard. Very good, Huntsman, said the liar, smiling. I'm impressed you figured it out. Unfortunately, you're too late. Squeezing the trigger, Devlin fired his crossbow. But nothing happened. Then the liar laughed. <laughs> now, give me your hand, and together we'll go. Suddenly, a knife pierced through Devlin's back, and the voice of a little girl whispered into his ear. Where nothing that moves lies under the snow. And there you have it, the tale of the Sisters Five. Well, would you look at that? Time to close up for the night. You'd best be on your way, friend. I hear there's an east wind coming, and I wouldn't want to be caught on the wrong side of the door when it gets here. (laughs) Sorry, we're closed. Come back tomorrow when... Hello? Is anyone there? That concludes our show for the evening. Thank you for listening to the Alabaster Cats podcast, and I hope you enjoyed my presence in the room. Next time, we'll explore the cute and the macabre as we discover what happens when children play games. If you liked what you heard tonight, help us fill the room with more bodies by leaving a review. Once again, thank you for joining us. I'm Alabaster Cats. And remember, the best stories are the ones we tell in the dark. Special thanks to tonight's talent, Rob Sharp, for his roles as the innkeeper and Devlin, Natalie Nightingale for her role as Reynard, Amy Brown for her role as the Temptress, Selena Korn for her role as Lavinia, Andres Hernandez and Elvia Dulcimer for their musical arrangement of The Eulogy of Snow, and Phoebe Street for melody arrangement and vocals.